The National Mall in Washington, D.C. is a phalanx of monuments and museums. But 12 miles south on an army base sits an enormous, nondescript warehouse known as the Met of the Military. Its bounty is as eclectic as it is vast. No art critic seen it until now. Hi, I'm Jerry Salt, senior art critic for New York Magazine, and I'm here to show you Fort Belvoir. Fort Belvoir. I missed the pronunciation. Fort Belvoir. We're here to look at a history of art that is never told about soldiers, by soldiers. A sort of secret art history that you almost never think about. An art history that doesn't follow Impressionism leads to Cubism and on and on. This is a focused, intense, mind-boggling place. So come on in. God, I don't believe it. Oh my God. So, and you haven't even seen half of it yet. I feel like I've walked into another room in my imagination, mm -hmm. like uh, the, the last scene from Citizen Kane. <laughs> Show me what you've got. There's paintings on both sides. A lot of art, we just sort of sit back and go, oh, I admire its form, or worse, that it cost a million dollars for a banana. But this art looks like it has a more ancient, even archaic purpose, which is to do something. Mm -hmm. What was this art meant to do? I think you've nailed it right there, that this art is meant to make the war accessible to the American people. The Army first started its war artist program in World War I. Right. Um, and these are active duty soldiers who uh, generally had some art training. And uh, they were given art brushes, paint brushes, and uh, sent out uh, with the mission of documenting what the Army was doing. Um, so that legacy goes back to World War I and it continues up to this day. Incredible. One second, I just want to see something. Absolutely. Wow. World War II, 1945. China or Japan? What's interesting is right here, and say, in the 40s, they're picking up on late 19th century yeah. style. So for them, style is less important than subject matter, would you say? I would say the subject matter is very important in number these. Number one. Number one. This stands out. So mm -hmm. what's what's going on here? This is 1965. American servicemen. Yes, American servicemen. Fighting we nowhere have. and fighting nobody. That's and very important. Dying too. and being killed. Dying. That's pretty amazing. Now, at the same point, in America, you have Andy Warhol yes. making pop art. Mm -hmm. You have Frank Stella making minimal art, which is just mm -hmm. black stripes. Mm -hmm. And then over there, mm -hmm. you have somebody yes. trying to depict it. Again, not using the styles of the day. Let's see more. So this is Afghanistan, this is 2012, a couple of years later, and uh, he is doing exactly what you think he is doing. He's peeing? He's peeing into a PVC tube that's stuck in the ground. Wow. A lot of people thought when the camera was invented, that was the death of painting. Mm -hmm. And yet, a camera can't take a picture of hell. This. The title is great on this one, A Huge Responsibility. Huge is an unpoetic word. It sort of hits you the same way the painting does. It's very kind of flat, implacably made. And watch what it's showing. This is a translator, a sort of go-between, right? Maybe art critics are translators. I don't know. This is a good painting, partly because it communicates indirectly, but it has a stronger or a more mysterious impact. Could this go in a contemporary art show about the war in Iraq or Afghanistan? It certainly could. Would it be chosen? Doubtful. Why? Because the art world is not 
looking. This is not an attack on the art world. I am of the art world. I love the art world. Boom. <laughs> Art's been here since the beginning, since before the beginning. Neanderthal people made art. Art has always been here. Wow. Art is here now. Incredible. It comes from everywhere. It's being made by everybody all the time in the worst conditions and the best conditions. Here's both. That's a beauty. Let's take a look and try to see outside our little perfect modernist box.